Hi again everyone. This is the fourth and last weekly exercise for the studio module and this week we are going to cover action arrows to help communicate directional movement and you will be applying these to your product sketches where you have a feature that has some kind of movement. As you can see from the sketch here I've included two action arrows, one for the flip top lid for the detergent reservoir and also the oscillating arrow to show that the brush rotates in multiple directions. Let's have a look at constructing these action arrows in perspective and then I'll talk a little bit about the requirements of this last stage for the weekly exercises. If we just draw the proportions of an arrow, I'm going to start off with just a rectangle and I'm just going to divide that in half and obviously we have the tabs of the arrowhead, the point of the arrowhead, and essentially this is what we're going to be drawing in perspective. So if I needed to draw, let's say, a arrow pointing towards us, my understanding of one point perspective, that's a two lines converging to a vanishing point. Here's the center line. And just like from our little sketch up here, on the center line's the arrowhead point. Depending on what direction you want your arrow to be communicating movement, let's say towards us, I'm just going to add a little tab, choose a point on that center line, and that's going to be my arrowhead. And that's pretty much it. Or, of course, you could have a bi-directional arrow, so something that's communicating something towards and away from you. If that's the case, then we're still going to have tabs on the other end of that. Because it's in one point perspective, we can project this back to find the proportion of the tab in perspective. And then I'll just eye in some foreshortening and that's the arrowhead towards the back. Communicating uh, action left and right, and you want to draw it in one point perspective, well this is still a rectangle in one point perspective. To find the center, of course we can cross our diagonals to find the center, or you can just eye it in. Here I'm going to add my tabs. The near side ones are longer than the far side ones. Of course this is the center line, somewhere on that center line lives the point of the arrowhead and keep the proportions correct or the same. If you wanted to draw arrows that may be showing a upward movement, I could draw this rectangle in perspective. You can see that that's where my converging lines are to my vanishing point. Let's just cross our diagonals to find center, divide that in half. Here are the tabs to my arrowhead. Somewhere on the center line is the arrowhead point, and there's your arrow at an angle. It might be a stepped arrow. And this is my direction of vanishing point or the perspective. This is the center line. If in doubt, cross your diagonals and scribe through center line. Right, that's your center. Arrowhead tabs and then arrowhead point. And you can see it sorts itself out in terms of the perspective of this triangle of that arrowhead. So I'm just paying attention to my convergence. And this line, this is where my arrowhead tabs are going to be. That line also goes to the vanishing point. Rotational arrows are based on ellipses. So let's say, for example, I had something that 
rotated clockwise or anti-clockwise. That's going to be a rotational movement, obviously. So I can take, let's say, the guide width of my ellipses. We know that an arrow has a top edge, a bottom edge, and a center line. So I'm just going to do, do one ellipse for the top edge, one ellipse for the bottom edge, and one ellipse for the center line. If I want a clockwise rotation, that means the arrowhead's pointing that way. That's the top edge, that top ellipse is the top edge. There's my tab. Here's the bottom edge of the arrow. There's the bottom tab. Somewhere on the center is the arrowhead point. I join up the dots. Let's say I want the tab or the, the tail of the arrow to end here. It's just a vertical line. And then it's a matter of just tracing off the top edge of that arrow and the bottom edge of that arrow. We will also see the underside that turns. And you can see this is a good reference point for those um, paper strip sketch models that we're doing, right? So we want to, that line wants, needs to be believable that it rolls under and meets up with that curve and continues through. So let's just do a few others. We'll go the other way. So anti-clockwise arrowhead pointing that way. A point here, there's my tab. Here's my arrowhead point. Let's say the tail finishes here. So I'll come in, I'll define that top ellipse or section of the ellipse that we can see. This is the tangent where it rolls away, meets up to the bottom edge, and of course there's the tail. So I'll just do one more, top edge, bottom edge, center line. So this might be the tabs, tabs again, I'm showing dual direction of uh, rotational movement. So there's the arrowheads. I'll be able to see this part of the top ellipse. Little tangent. To the bottom ellipse and we can probably just see that part of the back edge of that bottom ellipse. Okay so these are I call them horizontal rotational arrows because it's in a horizontal mo motion but what if we're like a doorknob rotating vertically so let's have a look at those. So I'm going to use the abbreviated method of sketching cylinder and that is I drop in center line I show convergence right so these lines are converging to a vanishing point this is a center line the major axis is 90 degrees to that center line always on the center line is the minor axis of an ellipse so let's say I do leading edge far side edge, and here I'm just eyeing in the major axis being 90 degrees to that center line, and the center line of, of this disc which the arrowhead lives on. So let's say I'm going to do a clockwise rotation, which means the arrow is going to be pointing downwards this way. The arrowhead tabs should be pointing to the vanishing point. So here's my leading edge. So if you can't see this too clearly, I've constructed that really lightly. Far side tabs a little bit shorter. Somewhere on here is the arrowhead point. I join up the dots. This is the thickness of the arrow. Well, let's say the tail ends maybe here. So I'm taking this ellipse and I'm drawing another line 
This also goes to the vanishing point if you want the perspective to be correct. And then I'm tracing off that part of the ellipse that I can actually see. So here's the near side edge. Here's the far side edge. Oops. I'm just going to fix that up because that would make this tab way too long. There's the tangent. This line should go to vanishing point, as should this line to vanishing point. And then I follow this through and I'll probably see that much. Uh, let's make this one anti-clockwise so the arrowhead is pointing upwards. I'm just going to drop in three ellipses, the far side edge, near side edge, center line, and a little darker so you can see it this time. This is my arrowhead pointing up. These are the tabs. This line should be going to vanishing point. Here's the tab, near side tab, far side tab. Somewhere on that middle ellipse is the arrowhead point. Join up the dots. The tail of the arrow is probably, let's say, here. It's your choice, really. But this line should go to the vanishing point. And then trace off what I see. Now, I believe I've shown you this rendered sketch a few times in our online classes. Obviously, we're not going to be marker rendering in this particular project. So you will have a sketch pretty much like this. As we've already seen in previous classes. But what I'd like you to do is take your original sketch, construct your action arrows, and you'll do a clean trace off of your product with your arrows in place. Oh, sorry, I'm slightly out of view. You can see that I'm using that sketch as an underlay and then just positioning my rotational arrow underneath it. What I'd also like you to do is add call out notations. So, of course, I've got notations here identifying key features. Do take note, call out notations are written in all uppercase, all horizontal and pretty consistent. I think it's important to have consistency in height and width of your lettering. And I would keep your leader lines quite simple because your notations are there to support the sketch. And it's really important to have your spelling correct and your notes to be legible. The requirement is for these two pages to have three sketches instead of four that you've been doing in previous weeks mainly because you're going to need room for your action arrows and your notations. Okay, so I look forward to seeing these on Thursday. Good luck, guys.